on World News Tonight. Bad to worse. Afghanistan's Taliban officials claim that sending women to prisons was to save them from gender-based violence. Scandal of the decade. Japan's PM Fumio Kishida purges ministers to save premiership. Dragonet expanded. Hong Kong offers $1 million bounties on five overseas activists. And festive Moscow. Christmas markets and ice rinks come to life in Moscow as Russians prepare for the festive season. is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. A very good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We begin this week's final broadcast in Afghanistan with the harrowing details revealed in a UN report. According to a recently released United Nations report, the Taliban government in Afghanistan is imprisoning women survivors of violence and claims it is doing so to protect them. Before the Taliban seized power in 2021, there were 23 state-sponsored women protection centers in Afghanistan where survivors of gender-based violence could seek refuge. Now, there are none. A UN report that has found the Taliban government in Afghanistan is putting women abuse survivors in prison, claiming it is for their protection. The UN said the practice harms the survivors' mental and physical health. The report also noted that there are no more state-sponsored women's shelters as the Taliban government sees no need for such centers. The Taliban's suppression of women's rights in Afghanistan is one of the most harshest in the world. The United Nations Assistant Mission in Afghanistan say that the gender-based violence against the Afghan women and girls was known to be high even before the Taliban took over the country. But since then, such incidents have become even more common, given the impact of the economic, financial and humanitarian crisis which have affected the country. Women have also been increasingly confined to their homes, which heightens the vulnerability of domestic and intimate partner violence. Before the Taliban retook power in 2021, there were 23 state-sponsored women's protection centers or shelters in Afghanistan. Taliban officials told Unama that there was no need for such shelters as women must be with their husbands or male family members. One such state shelters were a Western concept. The officials said they would ask for male members of the family to make a commitment to not harm the woman survivor. In instances where she had no male relatives to stay with or where there were safety concerns, the survivor would be sent to the prison for her protection. This would be similar to how some drug addicts and homeless people are housed in the capital Kabul. Unam also noted that for one year period from 15 August 2021, the Taliban administration's handling of gender-based violence complaints was unclear and inconsistent. For example, there is no clear distinction between criminal and civil complaints, which does not ensure effective legal protection for women and girls. The complaints are mostly handled by male personnel, and Unama noted that absence of women personnel discourages the inhabit survivors from lodging complaints. Survivors are now no longer guaranteed redress for their complaints, including civil remedies and compensation. They are reportedly more afraid of the Taliban government and the arbitrary actions, and thus choose not to seek formal justice. Next in Japan, embattled Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida dropped four cabinet ministers, trying to limit the fallout from the biggest financial scandal his ruling party has faced in decades. Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida purged his cabinet on Thursday in the wake of a major controversy. He wants to contain the fallout from the biggest finance scandal his ruling party has faced in decades. Kishida removed four ministers, including Chief Cabinet Secretary Hirokazu Matsuno and Industry Minister Yasutoshi Nishimura. He's replaced them with experienced heads, including a former Foreign Minister and former Justice Minister. Yoshimasa Hayashi is the new Chief Cabinet Secretary. As the government is under intense scrutiny, I would like to do whatever I can within the responsibilities given to me to restore trust. The removed ministers all hail from the Liberal Democratic Party's most powerful faction that is at the centre of a criminal investigation into missing accounts. Media reports have said an investigation into the scandal focuses on dozens of lawmakers. It reportedly wants to find out whether they benefited from fundraising events that kept millions of dollars off official party records. The scandal has hit the government's popularity and left analysts questioning whether Kishida can survive until September next year when a leadership vote for the ruling party is due. A poll on Thursday suggested the clear-out was unlikely to stop Kishida's slide in public support. 
Just 17% of those polled said they backed his administration, the lowest for any Premier in more than a decade. Expanding its dragonet, Hong Kong police accused five overseas-based activists of violating a harsh national security law imposed by China and offered rewards of one million Hong Kong dollars for information leading to each of their arrests. Hong Kong authorities on Thursday added five more pro-democracy activists based overseas to a list of wanted people over alleged national security offences and slapped bounties of one million Hong Kong dollars, or just shy of $130,000 on each of them. It's part of a continuing crackdown on dissent under the city's national security law imposed by Beijing. The five join a list of eight wanted persons first announced in July. Steve Lee, Hong Kong's national security police chief, said the allegations against them include the incitement to secessions, incitement to the subversion, and the collusion with a foreign country or with an external element to endanger national security. The five are now in various countries, including the U.S. and Britain. One of them, activist Joey Su, is an American citizen. She told this showed, quote, the extraterritorial reach of the national security law and the chilling effect that follows. The U.S. State Department on Thursday condemned what it called egregious actions taken by Hong Kong. Spokesperson Matthew Miller. Uh, we deplore any attempt uh, to apply the Beijing-imposed national security law extraterritorially and reiterate that Hong Kong authorities have no jurisdiction within United States borders where the advocates for democracy and freedom will continue to enjoy their constitutionally guaranteed uh, freedoms and rights. British Foreign Secretary David Cameron also said the UK, quote, will not tolerate any attempt by any foreign power to intimidate harass or harm individuals or communities in the country. I decided not to go back to Hong Kong. Early this month, another prominent activist, Agnes Chow, announced that she had traveled to Canada and would jump bail over a national security offense. Police said if she did not return to the city to meet her bail conditions, she would become a fugitive. They also said they have arrested four people in Hong Kong for providing funds to two other wanted activists now based overseas. The first such arrests on financial assistance grounds under the national security law. Now on to the Israel war. A U.S. security envoy discussed with Israeli officials on how to better protect civilians during their war against Hamas in Gaza. And President Joe Biden appealed for lives in the Palestinian territory to be saved. As Israel pounded the Gaza Strip on Thursday, Washington's envoy was in Tel Aviv to discuss how its ally could better protect Palestinian civilians in its war on Hamas militants. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan met with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and spoke with other officials, including the country's defense minister, about possibly transitioning to what the White House called lower-intensity military operations in Gaza. Here's White House National Security Spokesperson John Kirby. One of the things that Jake did talk to him about uh, was progress in the war uh, and where the Israelis think it's going to go. Um, um, he did talk about um, uh, possible transitioning from what we would call high-intensity operations, which is what we're seeing them do now, to lower-intensity operations uh, sometime, you know, in the near future. But I don't want to put a timestamp on it. I think you can understand that the last thing we'd want to do is telegraph to Hamas what, uh, what they're likely to face in coming weeks and months. At an event in Bethesda, Maryland, was asked U.S. President Joe Biden if he wanted Israel to scale back its assault on Gaza by the end of the year. I want them to be focused on how to save civilian lives, not stop going after Hamas, but be more careful. Meanwhile, in the Rafah area of southern Gaza, dozens of wounded people were taken to the hospital on Thursday after an Israeli airstrike targeted a house. Paramedics said six were killed in the airstrike and dozens were injured, including women and children. Israel launched its campaign in retaliation for a rampage by Hamas, whose fighters killed 1,200 Israelis and seized 240 hostages in a cross-border raid on October 7th. Since then, Israeli forces have bombarded the coastal strip and laid much of it to waste. 
with nearly 19,000 people confirmed dead according to Palestinian health officials and thousands more feared buried under the rubble. Now in Australia, a pastry chef and a Vietnam veteran are among more than a dozen Australians who may have been targeted by phishing scammers. A man has since been charged over the elaborate operation which cost victims close to a million dollars. It was one scam phone call in October that cost Rachel DeCandia $35,000. It's an actual nightmare. A week earlier, the pastry chef received a fraudulent email saying she had been charged twice on her Netflix account. The 28-year-old filled out her bank details hoping for a refund. Instead, she was robbed. Absolutely violated. It's just disgusting. The scammers gathered enough information before calling from a private number, pretending to be a member of the NAB fraud security team. They said my accounts had been leaked. Rachel emptied her bank accounts and then was was told her cards had been copied and needed to be sent for forensic analysis. A few hours later, an Uber turned up to her address. They told me over the phone to just put my cards in a bag, um, just put it on the back seat and say, take to the destination. The thieves splurged on iPhones and purchased gift cards from Officeworks, Kmart, Coles Express and withdrew $4,000 from a NAB ATM at High Point. Which they then convert into crypto. By doing it that way, it just can't be tracked. Vietnam veteran Shane Arnold was also targeted. You feel like somebody's taking a part of your life away. You'll just lose everything. Similar to Ray Rachel, the 70-year-old, also received a dodgy email and then a phone call. The grandfather lost $18,000 after the scammers purchased gift cards from various businesses around Mooney Ponds, filled up at a service station in Footscray and also bought $2,800 worth of Apple devices. One man has since been charged. They're literally destroying people's lives. Let's go for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. The latest U.S. election updates on the road to the White House. The Michigan Court of Appeals said that it won't stop former President Donald Trump from appearing on the state's 2024 Republican primary ballot, turning aside challenges from critics who argue that his role in the 2021 attack on the U.S. Capitol disqualifies it. The court confirmed two lower court rulings without determining whether Trump falls under insurrection clause in the Constitution's 14th Amendment. The court further said that Trump's possible spot on a general election ballot was not right for consideration. The two-sentence clause in the 14th Amendment has been used only a handful of times since the years after the Civil War. It is likely that one of the lawsuits challenging Trump eventually will be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court, which has never ruled on the insurrection clause. The Michigan court decision was similar to one from the Minnesota Supreme Court, which said that Trump could stay on that state's primary ballot there because the election is a party-run contest. Emboldened by battlefield gains and flagging Western support for Ukraine, a relaxed and confident President Vladimir Putin said that there would be no peace until Russia achieves its goals, which he says remain unchanged after nearly two years of fighting. It was Putin's first formal news conference that Western media were allowed to attend since the Kremlin sent troops into Ukraine in February 2022. In a first since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, Vladimir Putin holding an end-of-year news conference. Fronting international media and taking carefully vetted questions from the public. On the war with Ukraine, the Russian president revealed there are currently 617,000 Russians fighting. There will be peace when we achieve our goals, he says. What he calls a special military operation has been widely condemned from the outset, but has recently been overshadowed by the Israel-Hamas war. Look at what is happening in Gaza and feel the difference. 
Well, there is nothing like that in Ukraine, he says. A stream of text messages were also shown, many of them critical, as the man who's held power for nearly 24 years and recently announced he's running for re-election in 2024 insisted it's the West who's ruined relations with Russia. Perhaps the strangest part of the four-hour conference coming when Mr Putin took a question from himself. Uh, An AI-generated version asking the real Putin about rumoured body doubles and the dangers of artificial intelligence. This as Ukraine recorded a crucial win in its bid to join the EU. Leaders gathered for a summit in Brussels agreeing to open accession talks with Ukraine and Moldova. It is extremely important. We want to support Ukraine. It's a very powerful political signal. Volodymyr Zelensky posting, this is a victory for Ukraine, a victory for all of Europe, a victory that motivates, inspires and strengthens. Hungary, whose PM has opposed their membership, didn't participate. Its leader later blocking an $81 billion EU aid package that would have helped prop up Ukraine's government for the next four years. European Union leaders granted Ukraine a major political win by agreeing to start membership negotiations at a time when its counter-offensive against Russia's invasion has failed to make major gains and U.S. military aid has become more uncertain. This is a historic moment. In a major political win for Kyiv, European Union leaders agreed on Thursday to start membership talks with Ukraine. EU diplomats and officials said it was unexpected and that the green light came as Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban, who had for weeks said he would block a deal, agreed to leave the room knowing the vote would go ahead. Such an unusual way to approve a decision, especially such a major one, is unheard of in Brussels. Orban confirmed that he had abstained from the vote on what he called a bad decision. Mr. Orban was very well aware of the decision was, that was going to be made. Belgian Prime Minister Alexander de Croo. The message that is given is a very clear message. We are on the side of the Ukrainians who are fighting for our freedom, who are fighting for respect of, uh, of, their, uh, of their country. And the message to Moscow is also a very clear one. We will not be intimidated. The European unity is there and we are on the side of the Ukrainians, even at the most difficult moments. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky welcomed the move in a social media post, writing, History is made by those who don't get tired of fighting for freedom. The European Council also decided on Thursday to open accession negotiations with Moldova, grant EU candidate status to Georgia, and also advance a bid by another hopeful, Bosnia and Herzegovina. For Ukraine, the talks themselves are likely to take years. The decision comes at a time when Ukraine's counteroffensive against Russia's invasion has failed to make major gains and U.S. military aid has become more uncertain. Moving on to South America, Brazil's Congress overturned a presidential veto that had struck down the core of a bill to limit indigenous land claims, setting up a likely clash at the Supreme Court. Brazil's Congress on Thursday overturned a presidential veto on a bill to limit indigenous land claims, setting up a likely clash at the Supreme Court. President Luis Inácio Lula da Silva's veto in October was supported by indigenous groups while the bill, which limits claims to ancestral lands where indigenous people lived in 1988, had the backing of Brazil's powerful farm lobby. Lawmakers from both chambers voted overwhelmingly to overturn Lula's veto. Indigenous leaders and advocates gathered in the capital, Brasilia, to protest Congress's decision. They say protecting their lands is the best way to preserve the Amazon rainforest, which scientists say is crucial to curbing climate change. I want to say to all of you, what has happened now in Congress is the route to destruction. Chief Rayoni Metukire of the Kayapo people has become an international symbol for the fight against deforestation. In an interview, Kire called on Congress to do better by the country's nearly 1.6 million indigenous people, many of whom have been threatened by the advance of Brazil's agricultural frontier into the Amazon. I really want you, deputies and senators, to work for the good of all of us, just for us to work and live within our territory. I want to say to other indigenous people who are listening that we have to unite. All the relatives have to get together. If you keep saying that the white man can do work in the village, mining, timber, these things, it's going to be very bad for us. 
Opposition lawmakers, meanwhile, argue that indigenous people do not face a shortage of land, but of support to develop the land they already own. And Brazil's Congressional Farm Caucus has argued that greater legal security would curb often deadly land conflicts. But indigenous leaders have warned that the legislation backed by the farm lobby would, in fact, escalate such violence. The issue is expected to be decided by the Supreme Court, which ruled in September that the 1988 deadline was unconstitutional. Welcome back. A micro-earthquake has rattled Mexico's capital. For more on that story and much more, let's take you around the world in a minute. A micro-earthquake hit Mexico City, rattling buildings and sending people to the streets. No damages or fatalities were reported. Chinese authorities closed highways in several provinces and suspended train services as a cold wave extended its grip further over the country and temperatures continued to plummet below freezing. As the Democratic Republic of Congo gears up for elections on December 20th, the opposition and independent observers warned that issues including illegible voter cards, blocked campaign claims and electoral list delays threatened the legitimacy of the results. Hundreds of people gathered at the Sydney Opera House Australia today to celebrate the life of entertainer Barry Humphreys. Humphreys, best known for his character Dave Edna Everest, who blossomed from an Australian suburban housewife into a self-described gigastar, died in April at 89 years old. The auction of six shirts worn by Lionel Messi during Argentina's triumphant run at the 2022 World Cup closed yesterday with a memorabilia selling at $7.8 million. And that is all we have for you on World News Tonight. Join us again on Monday as we bring you updates from across the globe. If you missed any of today's programs, you can always re-watch by catching us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. Tonight, we're leaving you in Russia, where the festive season market on Moscow's Red Square is in full swing and elaborate decorations can be seen all around the center of the Russian capital ahead of traditional New Year celebrations. Thank you for watching. Have a great weekend.